Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. This is another video in our vasopressors and inotrope series. We're going to be talking about one of our darling favorite, both vasopressors and inotropes, right? If you're not familiar with that, maybe this is a curveball, known as epinephrine. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about what epinephrine is, its mechanism of action and the receptors it works on, dosing, administration, uses, pharmacokinetics, uh, clinical uses, some evidence and guidelines on it, side effects, complications. We'll compare it to norepinephrine, some clinical tips and tricks and all that good stuff. So definitely stick around. For those of you new to the channel, just know that all of these study guides, uh, such as this videos, uh, will be uploaded to our Patreon page as well as practice questions, definitely check that out if you're interested. We also have a weekly newsletter focusing mostly on public health and infectious disease. And then we have both a podcasting platform and a YouTube channel. So we would love for you to subscribe, check other things out. All of them will be in the episode description. Uh, let us know what you think. Hop along. Uh, last disclaimer, none of this intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please stick around to the end of this episode for uh, the full disclaimer in its entirety. No further ado, epinephrine. What is epinephrine to start? Well, epinephrine is actually also known as adrenaline, depending on where you practice. It actually might primarily be called adrenaline. Um, and this is a potent endogenous catecholamine. And when we're talking about vasopressors, if you've checked out any of our other past vasopressor videos, you'll hear us talk a lot about catecholamine or catecholaminergic or adrenergic. All these are synonyms for vasopressors that work on catecholamine receptors. Things like norepinephrine, epinephrine, phenylephrine. This is in comparison to non-catecholamine-based or non-adrenergic vasopressors. Things like vasopressin, angiotensin II, methylene blue, hydroxycobalamin. Again, all different vasopressors we're talking about in this vasopressor series. Um, but there's kind of two different categories. So epinephrine is a catecholamine uh, vasopressor, a catecholaminergic or adrenergic vasopressor. It acts on catecholamine receptors. Particularly two that we talk most about with vasopressors being the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, which we're going to talk more about. Uh, epinephrine is widely used in shock states, cardiac arrest, and anaphylaxis. Uh, it plays a significant role in the management of refractory hypotension in the ICU, and it's definitely one we need to know about. What is interesting about epinephrine, uh, especially compared to norepinephrine, its sister vasopressor, is that epinephrine actually has mixed inotropic and vasopressor properties. Inotropic meaning increasing cardiac output, so affecting the heart more, and vasopressor, which means increasing the mean arterial blood pressure or affecting the blood pressure more. So it is this mixed effect, which we're gonna talk more about. And that mixed effect comes from its mechanism of action. So the receptors that epinephrine acts on are, um, I don't want to say different than norepinephrine, but um, the ratio and how strongly it affects different receptors is different. So when we talk about the two different receptors, I'm going to draw a blood vessel covered by kind of smooth muscle here. So there's a blood vessel covered by smooth muscle that uh, is coating the blood vessel. And then we'll draw a heart too. Excuse our bad drawings. That's a heart, right atrium, right ventricle left atrium, left ventricle. If you're listening to some podcast form, you're not missing much on these drawings, but you can always hop over to the YouTube video. Um, so epinephrine works on the beta-1 receptor. Beta-1 is a receptor in the heart that increases contractility and increases heart rate. So it has inotropic effects, which is an increase in contractility, and it has chronotropic effects, which is an increase in heart rate. Whereas the blood vessels have alpha-1 receptors, and it causes, alpha-1 causes vasoconstriction of the blood vessels in that smooth muscle. So it vasoconstricts. So if we talk about epinephrine in particular, epinephrine has beta-1 effects on the heart, which increases heart rate, that chronotropic effect, increases contractility, that inotropic effect, and both of these lead to increased cardiac output. So this beta-1 effect by epinephrine is this inotropic effect, all right? It also, though, does affect alpha-1 receptors on blood vessels that cause vasoconstriction, increase in systemic vascular resistance, and increase in the mean arterial blood pressure. 
Epinephrine also has this beta-2 effect on the lungs. We're not going to spend much about it, but it can cause some bronchodilation. This is why you can use epinephrine to treat refractory bronchospasm and asthma. Um, and epinephrine can cause a lactate elevation. So uh, when some patient is getting epinephrine, it most likely will cause a lactate elevation. Now this elevation, you know, if you have someone on epinephrine and their lactate is going up, you shouldn't just bank on it being because of the epinephrine. You should make sure the lactate isn't increasing for other reasons, but epinephrine does and will cause um, some degree of lactate elevation. But primarily beta-1 effects and alpha-1 effects. Now these are dose dependent, which we're going to talk more about in dosing and administration. So when it comes to mechanism of action, epinephrine increases the MAP, the mean arterial pressure, through the alpha-1 receptor and increases cardiac output through the beta-1 receptor, but it also can cause hyperlactatemia. It increases myocardial oxygen demand because of that beta-1 effect making the heart squeeze in over time, and it increases the risk of tachyarrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and SVT because of that beta-1 chronotropic effect. So good things, but also a more robust side effect profile. Again, all things we'll talk more about in the video. So dosing and administration of epinephrine. When it comes, we're going to divide this up into three different um, uh, clinical scenarios. The first one being shock, the second one being cardiac arrest, and the third one being anaphylaxis, because they all require a slightly different approach. So in shock, Epinephrine is a continuous infusion. It's weight-based, meaning its units are micrograms per kilogram per minute. Now, some institutions take the kilograms out, and they do non-weight-based, all right, just in micrograms per minute. But most institutions, it's in micrograms per kilogram per minute. And you start at 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute, all right? And the titration range is then 0 0.05 to 0 0.3 micrograms per kilogram per minute uh, that you titrate it to. Now, all this is not a perfect science, right? Some places will titrate to much higher doses of epinephrine than other places. There's probably a peak epinephrine dose that is no longer effective above that dose. But what that is is really tough to say. All right. Um, most places do suggest a central venous catheter to give epinephrine. You probably can give it through peripheral IV if you're doing it in the right way, but only for a limited period of time. And there's really just not a lot of evidence in giving epinephrine uh, peripherally. Um, so more to come on that as evidence evolves. So central line is what's classically recommended here. Now we do want to point out that different doses of epinephrine have primarily beta-1 effects versus primarily alpha-1 effects. So primarily beta-1 effects, and remember those beta-1 were increasing cardiac output. Um, these are at lower doses of epinephrine. And those lower doses really are somewhere on the specter of that initial starting dose, you know, that kind of 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, primarily have that um, beta-1 effect. So if you're starting epinephrine just for something like bradycardia, you're really going to just set it at one of these lower doses, 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute. You don't want to titrate it up because the beta-1 effect then turns more into an alpha-1 effect, right? And that alpha-1 effect was vasoconstriction. It would just increase the mean arterial pressure. And this is, quote-unquote, higher doses, which is really doses just above that initial starting dose, all right? And we'll talk more about this later on in the video too. So for shock, continuous infusion, 0 0.01, 0 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute, um, best done in a central line, although there's some argument there. Cardiac arrest, you usually are giving one milligram IV push every three to five minutes per ACLS, Advanced Cardiac Life Support protocols. Um, and this is for all types of cardiac arrest. Now for ventricular dysrhythmias, there's some argument that um, after a couple doses of epinephrine, giving more might make um, the heart uh, have a tougher time getting back into sinus rhythm. Uh, but again, not great evidence here. So per ACLS, one milligram of epinephrine, IV push every three to five minutes. And then anaphylaxis, you're actually giving it IM, intramuscular, right? This is an EpiPen. If people have heard of EpiPens, hopefully you have. Um, it's 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams intramuscular every five to 15 minutes. If it is refractory in our practice pattern to two doses, we actually start an epi infusion, um, which is similar 
to if patients are in shock, that continuous infusion. But you do want to give it intramuscular, lateral thigh is a common place, 0.3 or 0.5 milligrams every 5 to 15 minutes. Um, and if it's refractory to this, you can uh, change it over to an epinephrine infusion for anaphylactic shock. Uh, and again, our practice pattern tends to be two intramuscular doses. And if it's still not effective, then we put them on an epinephrine infusion for anaphylactic shock. The pharmacokinetics here um, are similar to norepinephrine. The onset of action is immediate. It starts working within one minute. Um, and then the half-life is only two to three minutes. So if we think about five half-lifes, uh, folks say that five half-lifes is enough for the drug to be pretty much all out of your system. Um, that's just literally several minutes, somewhere around 10 minutes, the whole drug is gone. So when you stop it, it stops working almost immediately. It is metabolized by the MAO, monoamine oxidase, and COMT enzymes in the liver. Um, so patients with really bad liver function sometimes aren't able to metabolize it as well. Um, and then it's eliminated through the liver and the kidneys, but with inactive metabolites. Okay. So patients with really bad liver dysfunction, the half-life might be a little bit longer, um, but not by much, not, not nearly as much as something like vasopressin. Okay. Clinical uses. We kind of talked a little bit about this already. Anaphylaxis is a big one. It's the first line agent, intramuscular first, followed by intravenous continuous infusion if need be. Cardiac arrest, ACLS algorithms suggest giving it intravenously. Refractory septic shock, it is sometimes given when norepinephrine and vasopressin fail to achieve the target to map goal. You can consider it. Uh, bradycardia with hypotension uh, might be a nice drug, but remember this is at those low doses, right? Because you just want that beta 1 effect somewhere on that 0.01 to 0 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And then sometimes post-cardiopulmonary bypass it's used because it has that inotropic with that beta-1 effect and that uh, vasoconstrictive alpha-1 effect as a vasopressor. What evidence and guidelines do we have on epinephrine? Well, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign recommends epinephrine as a second or third line agent for septic shock after you've already started norepinephrine and vasopressin. <laughs> It can cause tachycardia, tachydysrhythmias, elevated lactate levels, all reasons that it is not first line in the eyes of the surviving sepsis campaign. ACLS, Advanced Cardiac Life Support, as we talked about, the AHA uh, recommends epinephrine as a cornerstone of cardiac arrest therapy. It improves return of spontaneous circulation, though no consistent survival benefit or neurologic outcome benefit. And this is really interesting if we just go on a little side tangent. In cardiac arrest, epinephrine is like a cornerstone, right? Anybody who's even had a whiff of ACLS training or even basic life-saving training um, has probably heard of epinephrine. But the data on epinephrine is really old school data. Originally was in like um, canine models and stuff. And there's not really good evidence to suggest that epinephrine uh, improves our survival or our neurologic outcomes in patients with cardiac arrest, there's actually an old study that looked at escalating doses of epinephrine, starting at one milligram and then increasing the dose with each subsequent administration in cardiac arrest. And they got the heart to restart more often, but the neurologic outcomes were way worse. And that's why we don't do it, right? There's no real benefit in long-term survival or functionality. So ACLS, you know, we still are suggesting that you follow ACLS as you should, but it is interesting to think about the evidence behind some of these things we do in cardiac arrest is really, really bad, really, really poor evidence. Um, and we certainly would benefit from um, more studies on this. It's just a really tough thing to study, right? Uh, comparative studies on epinephrine versus norepinephrine. It seems to have similar MAP effects, but epinephrine can cause more tachycardia, elevated lactate, and potentially some splanchnic ischemia, which is why norepinephrine is our first line drug as compared to epinephrine. Side effects and complications are similar to a lot of our catecholamine vasopressors. So we already talked about tachyarrhythmias because that beta-1 effect of epinephrine, you get more atrial fibrillation, more ventricular ectopy. It also can cause more myocardial ischemia because the beta-1 effect, you're asking that heart to squeeze harder and harder and harder. And while it's doing that, that heart is using more oxygen and it needs more blood flow. So if patients have coronary artery disease, it can increase oxygen demand and cause some degree of myocardial ischemia, like just from a global inability to get enough blood flow to the myocardial tissue. We talked about how it can cause lactic acidosis, whether that's clinically meaningful or not is tough to say, but the beta-2 receptor effect that it has, uh, remember we didn't focus much on it, but it has beta-2 effect, which can cause bronchodilation, which is why it is sometimes used in refractory bronchospasm and asthma. But that same beta-2 effect stimulates glycolysis, uh, glycolysis, 
which um, can lead to elevated lactates. It causes vasoconstriction, so you get the same type of concern for ischemia in the digits or the gut, um, especially at higher doses. And then beta-2 can also cause hyperglycemia and hypokalemia. Um, again, not super common things, but um, it can cause increased lactate, it can cause increased glucose, and it can cause decreased potassium um, are the three kind of metabolic things to note uh, for epinephrine. So if we compare epinephrine to norepinephrine, uh, sometimes it's helpful to compare both of these are what type of vasopressors, catecholamine or adrenergic vasopressors, right? These are synonyms, adrenergic and catecholamine. Um, so norepinephrine and epinephrine are catecholamine or adrenergic vasopressors. Um, so epinephrine has beta-1 effects and alpha-1 effects more than these mild beta-2. Beta-2 were for bronchodilation and increasing lactate and increasing glucose and decreasing potassium, whereas the beta-1 is the cardiac effects, alpha-1 is the peripheral vasculature effects. Norepinephrine has alpha and beta-1, but the alpha-1 effects are much big greater than the beta-1 effects for norepinephrine. Epinephrine increases heart rate Norepinephrine maybe mildly increases heart rate, but not by much. Uh, epinephrine increases cardiac output. Norepinephrine maybe mildly increases cardiac output, but not by much. Epinephrine does increase lactate. Norepinephrine does not really increase the lactate. Epinephrine has a higher risk of arrhythmias compared to norepinephrine. And epinephrine is uh, second or third line for septic shock, although it is first line for ACLS and cardiac arrest and anaphylaxis, whereas norepinephrine is first line in septic shock. So just a little comparison between the two. So if we were to summarize epinephrine, uh, epinephrine is a catecholamine vasopressor. Uh, it works on beta-1 receptors in the heart, alpha-1 receptors in the blood vessels, and beta-2 receptors in the lungs. Its typical use is first line in ACLS for cardiac arrest, first line in anaphylaxis, and then second or third line in refractory septic shock. The usual infusion dose for something like septic shock that you're starting at 0 0.01 uh, to 0 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute. In ACLS, the push dose is one milligram IV every three to five minutes. And in anaphylaxis, it is three, uh, oh goodness, did we blank on the dose? You caught us. Um, the It is 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams intramuscular um, that you can give every five to 15 minutes. Common side effects are tachycardia, right? Because it has those beta one adrenergic effects, increased lactate arrhythmias. Um, other side effects that are not as common are increasing glucose, decreasing potassium, uh, ischemia of the digits or the mesentery or splanchnic. And then the evidence, there's evidence in ACLS and anaphylaxis. There's mixed evidence in shock. And the evidence in ACLS, as we talked about, you do it, but the evidence is not that strong. All right, that is a summary of epinephrine, a part of our vasopressor series. Check out our other vasopressor videos um, or podcasts linked in the episode description. Uh, we'd love for you to check out our Patreon page, our free weekly newsletter, all that good stuff. Comment, hit the bell button, subscribe, join us. Uh, we appreciate you all. And either way, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next hey time. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on.